Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown. Across the table is my good friend Matthew hello. Stockton. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Um, hello, hello, hello. We're back again for more on our favorite British serial killer, Dennis Nielsen. Our favorite. That's a weird word to use. But... Yeah, right? Yeah. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. I have nothing. You have nothing? I have nothing. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> you only had one job. <laughs> In our last episode, we learned about the final killing and capture of British serial murderer Dennis Andrew Nielsen after police discovered human remains he'd flushed down the toilet at 23 Cranley Gardens in Muswell Hill, a suburb of North London. After his capture, the enigmatic Muswell Hill murderer, or kindly killer as he would come to be called, was more than happy to discuss his crimes. In this episode, we'll learn more about the killer's life, his other crimes, and what possibly led to the murders of 15 young men and boys, one of them a young Canadian student. You're listening to Dark Poutine, episode 228, Lonely Monster, Serial Killer Dennis Nielsen, part 2. Dennis Nielsen's mother, Betty White, no, not that Betty White, was a local gal from the Scottish port city of Fraserburg, Aberdeenshire. His father, Olav Magnus Moksham, was a Norwegian soldier who fled with the Free Norwegian Forces from occupied Norway to Scotland in 1942. Olav had taken the moniker Nilsson as his last name as it was much easier for the Scots and me to pronounce. You think so? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Olav had met Betty soon after his move to Scotland and they quickly had a son, Olav Jr., when Dennis Andrew Nilsson was born on November 23, 1945, he was the second of their kids. Olav and Betty didn't marry, and as Olav was often away attending to his military service, the young family lived with Betty's parents. Betty had a daughter after Dennis, making him the middle child. Even when Olav was home on leave, he wasn't really present. A nasty alcoholic, Olav was more interested in the bottle than his family. Betty and Olaf finally split in 1948, and he left Fraserburg and his wife and family behind. Looking for a father figure to fill the gap left by Olaf's absence, Dennis grew closer to his granddad, Andrew White. When Andrew wasn't off working on fishing trawlers, he spent time with Dennis. Andrew was the only member of the family that Dennis was ever able to connect with in any meaningful way and was lonely when his grandfather was at sea. In October of 1951, Andrew had been away for some time fishing in the North Sea. Dennis arrived home from school one cold fall afternoon to find Betty sobbing in the living room. When Dennis asked what was wrong, Betty responded with a question of her own. Did Dennis want to see his grandfather? When Dennis said yes, she took him into the kitchen, where Dennis was surprised to see the one and only person to whom he felt true affection, his grandfather, laid out in an open casket. Andrew had died of a heart attack while at sea and was brought home for his burial by his shipmates. 
Dennis was traumatized and called this a major point in his development. Dennis later said, my troubles started here. This would screw you up. It would. But as an adult, you're responsible for your own actions. But but there's a few things in his childhood that I'm noticing Mm -hmm. um, that we'll talk about a little bit later. um, As as we go, yeah. And and talk about some of the victims as well, because there's a bit of a theme here for me that you you might not see. But there was no preparation that his grandfather had died. right? Right. He thought he was walking into the kitchen to see his grandpa. Yeah. Right? You, you, that that could have been handled a little bit more sensitively. Yes. Yeah. Totally. Dennis loved animals, especially dogs, and found comfort in pets for the rest of his life. They were loyal and they would never leave you. Dennis retreated deeper into himself, becoming even more of a loner. He spent hours by himself walking along the Scottish shore, thinking and staring out at the cold ocean. Nilsson claims this is where he had his sexual awakening. He'd seen a swimmer rescued by lifeguards. He was enamored by the sight of the half-naked young swimmer being given mouth-to-mouth by good-looking lifeguards. The young man was soon revived by the efforts of his rescuers. Soon after that, Dennis claimed he was mesmerized by the sea and fantasies in his head of the swimmer he'd seen only days before. In his reverie, he walked out too far and was himself caught in the undertow. In History of a Drowning Boy... Nielsen's recently released memoir, written mostly behind bars, he wrote about the incident in flowery prose. Quote, Hypnotized both by the presence of the mighty ocean and my own emotional predicament, I began to move forward with the sea now covering my shoes and socks and whooshing around my ankles. Ever forward I walked up to my knees, then up to my thighs, deeper and ever slowly forward. The cold rapid numbness carried me steadily on deeper, past my waist, where I was now feeling the weight and power of the ice-cold water. The sharp cold was gone as I stepped onwards out of my depth, and I sank into the clear, green, peaceful world of endless slow motion. Soothing drones of murmurings sequestered my hearing and filled my mind with the slow, bass beating of my heart and its rushing pump of lifeblood. That everlasting instance of peace was supplanted by that vital intrusion of the will for survival involuntary and vital a few seconds more in that embracing peace and there would have been no return i broke the surface into a waking dream as i was pulled unconscious from the sea in reality i was staggering wet and traumatically exhausted towards the shore and i imagined the thrilling vision that i was being carried by the young man i had seen being rescued himself a few days earlier I flopped down on the hot sand in a hollow in the dunes and imagined him undressing me, while undressing myself, with my face to the sky, while effecting limp immobility. He slowly denuded my body of its soggy garments. I explored my own nakedness, revealed with my own hands, while imagining I was being done by him, by his hands. In this ritual, a great, relieving wave of peace rolled slowly over me. End quote. So there's a weird theme mm-hmm. of water, right? His, yes. His, his father was a... Um, his grandfather. His father was a seaman. Right, yeah, uh, yeah. Norwegian. His grandfather died and he saw his dead body, his still body on a table. Mm-hmm. He saw somebody drowning and whose limp body was being resuscitated. Yep. And these things are sticking into his head in really weird ways. Mm-hmm. It's... He is. He was well aware of that, yeah. and and that's why he called his memoir "History of a Drowning Boy." Yeah. It's it's really fascinating, and I'm not saying that I like Dennis Nielsen. Don't get me wrong. No. What I'm saying is that the insight that he gives is odd, and I don't know if it's even conscious on his part yeah. that he's he's giving us as much information as he is yeah. in this regard. But this is where he started to become twisted sexually. Yeah. In other writings, he claimed that he'd imagined it was his grandfather rescuing him. And I'm not sure of the Freudian significance of that, but there must be something to it. Definitely. Uh, Around this time, Dennis also discovered music, which would be a passion and form of escape throughout the rest of his life. At first, he was moved by classical and popular music, listening for hours with his eyes closed in deep reverie and fantasy. And later on, he found progressive rock like The Who, uh, Rick Wakeman, all that kind of stuff. Does it make you angry that you like the same music that he did? No, 
but it <laughs> makes me look at the music in a little different ways, especially some of the songs. Yeah. Uh, Betty married another man, Andrew Scott, and Dennis hated his stepfather. The feeling seemed mutual as Olav Jr. got the praise and attention while Dennis was ignored, which he resented deeply. They moved to Strichen. Dennis hated it there. It was 12 kilometers away from the sea in which he'd taken so much comfort. According to Alan R. Warren's book about Nilsson, Dennis, afraid of his homosexual feelings, began to fondle his sister Sylvia in the hope that his gay urges would go away. It gave him no pleasure, but most likely left his sister very damaged. It was also around that time that Dennis had an encounter with another boy who touched him against his wishes, further confusing Dennis. From Alan R. Warren's book, Drinks, Dinner, and Death, quote, Dennis shared a bed with his older brother, Olav. On several occasions after Olav fell asleep, Dennis would fondle or touch his brother sexually. Once, Olav woke up and caught Dennis. He confronted him. After that, his brother belittled him publicly and called him a hen, which is Scottish for girl, end quote. Dennis felt different from the other boys his age, having more interest in things like art and history rather than athletic pursuits. The other kids bullied the lanky, weird youth. He found a bit of a home in the military when he discovered the Army cadets at 14 years old. It had the structure he needed, and a year later at 15 he dropped out of school. He tried work at other jobs, but the armed forces called to him, and he enlisted in 1961. He was introverted, shy, and secretly attracted to a few of his fellow recruits at Aldershot, where he was first stationed. He fantasized while watching soldiers dress and shower, but fearing that his body might give away his attraction to the others, he tended to dress and shower on his own. Mm. Dennis was assigned to the Army Catering Corps, where he trained as a cook and learned how to expertly butcher meat. This skill would serve him well later on in his darker escapades. Nielsen claimed that his first three years in the military were by far the happiest in his life. According to Brian Masters, Nielsen loved the comradeship of Army life. It was in the Army that Dennis found alcohol. It took the edge off and loosened him up. From Alan R. Warren's Drinks, Dinner, and Death, quote, In 1964, Nilsson passed the catering exam and was stationed at the 1st Battalion of the Royal Fusiliers in Osnabrück, West Germany, serving as a private. Later, his fellow soldiers described him as very shy and quiet, noticing that he would often get drunk in order to ease his shyness, end quote. The other soldiers liked him when he was drunk. He was wacky and fun. He drank alcoholically for the rest of his life outside prison. One night, on leave in Germany, fortified by strong drink, Bacardi rum was a favorite, Nielsen mustered up the courage to have his first real sexual experience and hired a male prostitute. As mentioned previously, booze was a comfort and also fuel his ever-darkening fantasies. According to Alan R. Warren's book, quote, The men he dreamed about having sex with would be unconscious, sometimes even dead. That way, they wouldn't know Nielsen had sex with them. Nielsen admitted there were a few instances when he was drinking with other soldiers and pretended to be passed out. He secretly hoped that they would have sex with him while he was unconscious. But to his dismay, it never happened, end quote. He was fascinated with death. He would powder his body with talcum to make himself whiter, used blue food coloring to give him a cyanotic corpse-like appearance on his lips. He would then lay on his bed in a death pose and stare at himself, which excited him as he masturbated. There's, there's something else going on here mm -hmm. as well. There's uh, the need, the fear of being found out mm -hmm. that he's gay. Yep. So the need for an unconsciousness so people can't say anything. This mixed with his um, his obsession, with, you know, with having seen the drowning boy and seeing his grandfather. He's, all this stuff swirling into a very, very weird place in his brain. Yeah, it's like all of these things together are what crossed his wires. Yeah. And you can't uncross those once they're, once that sort of... Yeah. Groove has been established. Yeah. Dennis saw the horrors of war when he was deployed to Aden, South Yemen, where he acted as a cook for the Al Mansura prison. Insurgents attacked regularly, sometimes killing and maiming Nilsson's fellow soldiers. 
The sight of a dead body fascinated Nielsen, and thoughts of sex with dead soldiers became fodder for Dennis Nielsen's fantasies as he lay alone in his private room at night. He dreamed of washing the corpses before having sex with them, a ritualistic and signature behavior that would also feature over the span of his later murders. The local Yemenis resented the presence of the British. Sometimes soldiers were attacked while away from the safety of their base. Nielsen claimed he was attacked at one point, clunked on the head and knocked unconscious by a taxi driver. He was then thrown into the trunk of the man's cab where he later came to. When the car stopped and the cabbie opened the trunk, Dennis, armed with a tire iron he'd found beside him in the trunk, claimed to have bashed the man over the head and fled. I call bullshit on that story. Yeah, that's one of those uh, I'm pumping myself up stories. Yeah, I call total bullshit on that. Yeah, I kind of think that that's a fib as well. After Yemen, there were several more deployments. According to Alan R. Warren, quote, in 1969, he was assigned to Cyprus and then to Berlin, Germany. While Nilsson was in Berlin, he hired a female prostitute to have intercourse with him. He thought this would give him bragging rights around the other soldiers. He later described this encounter as depressing and overrated, end quote. Is he a self-hating homosexual? Is, is that what this is? Like he's, he hates his own desires so much he'll do anything to cover them up and not to, to show them? I don't know if he's self-hating, mm-hmm. but... Um, because he is a narcissist, so that... trying to yeah. cover it up. Yeah. I think he's just simply trying to cover it up. I don't think he's trying to necessarily make himself straight by sleeping with a female sex worker. Mm-hmm. But he was trying to do it, like you said, here for bragging rights, right? Yeah, so why, so, but why keep the secret? Why keep the secret? Matthew, I know the answer, <laughs> but I'm, I'm asking you to elaborate on it. Yeah, I mean, because that's what you did. Yeah. You know, I've, I was watching um, uh, Stranger Things, mm-hmm. and nobody's talked about this online, but the one kid... Yeah, clearly. Is gay. Clearly. And the conversation, there's a spoiler alert, but not, not really spoiling anything. He has a conversation with his brother where it's not said. Yeah. But the brother's like, you know, I love you and no matter what, but it's not said. And I'm watching this and I'm like, wow, they totally 100% nailed what it was like being a gay young teenager in the mid 80s. In the 80s. Because even the people that cared about you mm-hmm. would go around the topic to, even 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 the ones that were supporting you would go around it and not even say it. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. So if you're living in that sort of society, and I'm going to talk about some of the, like, I'll, I'll get there in a minute because I just, I'm seeing a bit of a trend in, in the way some of the victims are described by, their, by people that they knew. Yeah. People who are going to be bad, you know, sure. when, when they're rejected by society are worth. Mm-hmm. People who are on the edge and might have some problems that aren't necessarily bad, bad, are going to end up in a much worse situation when everyone, when the police, when family, society rejects them. Yeah. And it makes for somebody who is able to murder 15 people and get away with it for so long. Mm -hmm. Because also it's like, oh, they're, they're fags, they don't matter. Yeah. Or, oh, just drifters, right? This is what happens. At the end of the 1960s and into the 70s, Dennis Nielsen became disenchanted with the British military. He was particularly vocal about his displeasure with the British military activity in Ireland during the period referred to as the Troubles. The era was simplified in Wikipedia, quote, The conflict was primarily political and nationalist, fueled by historical events. It also had an ethnic or sectarian dimension, but despite use of the terms Protestant and Catholic to refer to the two sides, it was not a religious conflict. A key issue was the status of Northern Ireland, Unionists and Loyalists, who for historical reasons were mostly Ulster Protestants, wanted Northern Ireland to remain within the United Kingdom. Irish Nationalists and Republicans, who were mostly Irish Catholics, wanted Northern Ireland to leave the UK and join a united Ireland, end quote. There were riots in August of 1969. British troops were deployed and hastily constructed peace walls were erected to separate Protestant and Catholic communities. After what was later called the Bloody Sunday Massacre on January 30th, 1972, Dennis Nielsen decided to quit the military. British soldiers had shot 26 unarmed civilians during a protest march in the Bogside area of Derry, Northern Ireland. 
After more than 11 years of military service, Nielsen had nowhere to go and returned home to his family to determine his next move. A lot of soldiers um, started questioning uh, what they were doing at that time after Bloody Sunday. Yeah, because, you know, what are we doing here? Why are we involved in this? Why, well, why when, are... when 26 civilians are, 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 mm-hmm. are killed, it's like, yikes, there's something wrong here. Something's not right. Yeah. In the three months that Dennis spent back at home, still firmly in the closet, he soon discovered that his family would not accept the truth about him when it came out. According to Alan R. Warren, quote, During this time with his family, they watched a documentary on television about homosexuals. His family was openly disgusted by what they learned. Despite knowing how they felt, Dennis told his mother he was homosexual. The family argument that ensued ended in Nielsen leaving and never speaking to any of his family again, with the exception of a few sporadic letters exchanged with his mother, end quote. So there you have it, right? Another aspect of this. You start losing your social connections, so, or being able to actually have a functional relationship. That, mm-hmm. Because believe it or not, relationships need to be supported. Yeah. And when Justin and I got married, instead of uh, just the I do, I do with our, we, we didn't, we had a humanitarian. Okay. He, uh, he turned to the audience, the people at the wedding yep. and said, you know, this is a marriage. There'll be different times and there'll be trouble and there'll be, you know, mm-hmm. do you, will you say you will support this couple during these times? And he made everyone at our wedding said, I do to us as well. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and and you know, so if 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 your relationship is, com- you know, people were kicked out of their houses, mm-hmm. right? You know, and I'm not defending him at all. No, no. But yeah. but you know, he can't bring a boyfriend home to mom and develop a normal relationship either. Right. Yeah. Right. And I'm not saying people that were kicked out of home and gay like ended up like this. A lot of them became like billionaires like all kinds but this guy was already like sick but this didn't help right? no yeah. because it's all hidden relationships mm-hmm. and it's all hidden victims in the end right right yeah. like very hidden victims yeah. yeah yeah dennis moved to london and joined the metropolitan police force in december of 1972 he thought perhaps the police service would offer the same camaraderie he discovered in the armed forces giving him another pseudo family Yes, the police force was a brotherhood, but Dennis did not fit in with the other more macho officers who, with puffed-up chests, spewed homophobic rhetoric. Dennis was involved in some minor arrests, but nothing exciting. He left the police force after a year, later citing homophobia as the main reason. And there's different takes on why he left. There were also people who said he was just difficult. I'm sure he was difficult, yeah. difficult as well, and he was probably citing that. But that probably would have been any gayest cop experience uh, back in 1972 in London. Sure, of of because uh, it still is in some cases, right? Mm-hmm. Disappointed that he'd failed again and desperately lonely, Nielsen found a job working as a civil servant, taking a position as a junior counselor at a job center. So that's an employment center. He progressed slowly in his career until his arrest in 1983. According to Brian Masters in Killing for Company, quote, work did appear to be an obsession with him, and some wondered whether his life might hide some crucial emptiness which work attempted to fill. But work still wasn't enough. Yeah. There was something missing. In 1973, Nilsson was living at 9 Manston Road, North London. He started going to well-known gay pubs and bars around London, drinking heavily, trolling for someone to keep him company. Some of his haunts were King William IV, the Colhern, Golden Lion, the Black Cap, the Salisbury, and Cricklewood Arms. He had many casual sexual encounters with men he met at the bars, but none stuck, and that is at least until he met a 20-year-old man named David Galachin. So when I first moved to London, yep. I lived on Rupert Street. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Golden Lions on Dean Street. It was a three-minute walk from my house, and I went often. I used yep. to drink back then. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I eventually moved to Earl's Court, and the Colhern was literally my local pub wow. on the corner. And so I knew of, when I first moved to London, I heard about Nelson because the Colhern actually, he picked some guys up at the Colhern and murdered them. But the Colhern is a bar where two other serial killers also picked men up. Oh, wow. So the Colhern had their three different serial killers that got some of their victims from the Colhern. That's crazy. Yeah. 
In November of 1975, David Galichin was being pushed around by two larger men outside a gay bar when Nilsson swooped in to the rescue. Dennis offered Galichin food, drinks, and a place to stay, something he'd do many times with many other men later on. Galichin took him up on his offer, and the two spent the night together. The next morning, Dennis asked David whether he'd like to stay as a roommate, and Galichin agreed. Dennis was over the moon. Instantly in love, Dennis used the 1,000-pound inheritance he'd gotten after the recent death of his stepfather to secure he and David a larger apartment at 195 Melrose Avenue in Cricklewood. Dennis loved that the flat had access to a large private garden behind the home, and he spent hours tending the plants there and doing a bit of landscaping. This garden would also feature largely later in the investigation of Nilsson's crimes at that address, it was also the point that a puppy, Dennis named Bleep, came to live with them. It didn't take long before the honeymoon was over. David didn't work and Nilsson began to resent coming home from a hard day at work to see that the younger man had done nothing around the house. Dennis let the more passive David know how unhappy he was with his laziness and began to boss him around. For a while, David took the abuse, knowing he had nowhere else to go. Dennis was nasty when he drank. One moment, Dennis would be swearing and cursing David up and down. The next, after a few more drinks, Dennis was in reverie, chain-smoking with his headphones on, listening to music, eyes closed. He loved classical music like Mahler, Grieg, Sibelius, and Elgar, but he was also obsessed with progressive rock. Rick Wakeman's 1974 concept album, Journey to the Center of the Earth, was a particular favorite, as were bands like Genesis and The Who. I did actually a Spotify playlist of music that Dennis Nielsen would like to listen to, so I have made that, and I will share it in the show notes. The Who? Mm-hmm. My friend Doug used to live with one of the members of The Who. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, two blocks from the Colhern. Yep. <laughs> well, there you go. But yeah, the playlist is good. The Who is an amazing band. Dennis Nielsen's schizoid behavior wore David down. They began sleeping in separate rooms to which they would both bring dates home for one-night stands. There were drunken arguments with harsh words between the men as jealousy reared its ugly head. From Alan R. Warren's book, quote, One day in May 1977, Nielsen returned home at 5.15 p.m. to find David gone. He'd packed up some of his clothes and left, leaving a note explaining he just couldn't continue in the relationship anymore. Nielsen was devastated. The pain of David's leaving brought back unresolved feelings from when he saw his grandfather dead in the coffin. Later, though, Nielsen told a different story of David's leaving, claiming that after the two had a fight, Nielsen ended the relationship and asked David to leave. Over the next two years, Nielsen brought home several other men, but nothing long-term came out of these encounters. The longest relationship he had after David lasted only a few weeks, end quote. One of the young men who'd had a brief relationship with Nielsen was Martin Hunter Craig. Craig later told the Sunday People newspaper about some of Nielsen's behavior. Quote, On the surface, he was a strict civil servant, said Martin Hunter Craig. But once inside his home, he turned into a vodka-swilling loudmouth, seeking vengeance on kids on the dole queue. He often said he would like to round up the scroungers and then rid the world of them. But as much as he detested his clients, he couldn't stop working. I always met him after work at the job center. He would often walk and spend as little money as possible on transport, yet he would think of nothing of buying a couple of bottles of gin or vodka on the way, end quote. Nielsen was furious and heartbroken that David had left. The rage that he'd had simmering within him began to boil. Some of the men Dennis brought home during this period later recounted frightening experiences with Dennis Nielsen. Some, even before learning of Nielsen's crimes, felt they'd narrowly escaped with their lives. Nielsen's hatred and anger finally boiled over at the end of 1978. And we'll be back after a quick break. Before we get to the break, I want to remind our listeners in the United Kingdom that I will be there at the end of this week and until July 30th, 2022. Good friend of the show and host of the podcast, Murder Mile UK True Crime, Michael J. Buchanan Dunn, has kindly set up a London meetup for fans of Dark Poutine and fans of Murder Mile. On July 23rd, 2022, at 6 p.m. London time, we'll be meeting at the Crown and Scepter at 86 Great Titchfield Street, London, W1, just off Oxford Circus. 
Attendees will be given a badge, dark poutine, and or murder mile to wear so you can identify like-minded listeners and start chatting. And with Mike from Murder Mile co-hosting, he's extended invites to other true crime podcasters in the area to attend so there may be extra surprises, including, perhaps, a giveaway of my Globe and Mail best-selling book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem. Come on out. Until then, here's the promo for Mike's podcast, Murder Mile. Friends, Mike here, host of Murder Mile. If you're looking for an original true crime podcast, covering cases you won't hear anywhere else, then Murder Mile is just for you. Over the last five years, Murder Mile has dived into hundreds of infamous and little-known cases, many of which happened within a square mile of London's West End. Asking the question, how many murders occurred on the same street, and even in the same building? As an award-nominated podcast, research using the original police files, Murder Mile truly is something different. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, check out Murder Mile. Thank you. And we're back. Uh, Matthew, thoughts on this so far? I think that living with somebody after you've broken up is a very bad idea, first yeah. of all. But yeah, I've actually seen interviews with, with that, his, his ex as well. And, mm-hmm. and um, you know, he, he didn't go into hiding or anything like that, but spoke out. It, you know, this guy is, he's this Nielsen character. He, he is, he's a total alcoholic. Yep. And very damaged human being. But interestingly, he denied until the very end that he was alcoholic. But he clearly was. Yep. Right? Like, clearly was. Mm -hmm. He had, I mean, as, you know, as we all know, it takes one to know one, and I am one, so. Yeah, but he just sounds nasty even to people that he supposedly Mm -hmm. wants to be with, you know? Yep. Yeah. The murder spree that would leave 15 men and boys dead began on December 30th, 1978. Dennis Nielsen's first murder victim was a 14-year-old Irish boy named Stephen Holmes. Dennis was drinking his face off at one of his usual haunts, the Cricklewood Arms Pub, not a gay bar, but close to Nielsen's home. Holmes came to Nielsen's attention when Dennis heard a commotion in front of the pub's bar. Nielsen noticed a slender and attractive young man arguing with the bartender. The young man loudly told the barkeep to fuck off and then stormed out of the pub. Dennis saw his opportunity and took it, racing out after the young man. Nielsen asked Holmes what had happened. Stephen told Dennis that he'd been at a concert nearby and stopped to get warm and to have a drink. The barkeep had refused Stephen's request for alcohol because he was underage, and that's when Holmes had stormed out. I mean, he was a pretty young boy. He was 14, yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Dennis told Stephen he could fix him up with a drink, some food, and a warm place to spend the night back at his flat, 95 Melrose Avenue. Dennis claimed that Holmes agreed. What happened next, again, has been recounted by Dennis Nielsen alone. Stephen Holmes cannot give us the story from his perspective. Dennis claimed that when they arrived home, they were met by the ubiquitous happy dog Bleep, as usual. Dennis also petted the cat named Dee Dee. They had some food, and after a few drinks, Dennis claimed that they had a consensual sexual encounter in Nilsen's bed, after which Holmes, full of drink, fell asleep. Dennis told the story of what happened next many times, and once again the details would change with each telling, most likely serving Nelson's current fantasy life with each occurrence. Dennis claimed that he became possessed with the idea that whether Stephen Holmes wanted to or not, one way or another, He'd be ringing in the new year with Dennis Nielsen. Nielsen said he caressed Stephen for a while as he slept, thinking that he didn't want the boy to leave him. Dennis reached for his necktie at the side of the bed and wrapped it around Holmes' neck. According to Brian Masters' book, Killing for Company, Holmes woke up and began to struggle. His last words were apparently, What the? As Dennis applied more pressure, tightening his grip on the tie, and the two struggled to the floor with Dennis atop the smaller teen. 
Stephen managed to get to his feet and fought for his life. They crashed around the flat. With Dennis intent on finishing the job he'd started, he overpowered the boy, and Stephen's body soon went limp. Dennis thought the deed was done, but noticed that Stephen, completely naked, was still breathing, albeit just barely, agonal breaths like a fish out of water. The tie was still wrapped tightly around Holmes' neck. Dennis wrote about what happened next in his memoir, History of a Drowning Boy. Oh God, I thought, when he regains consciousness, that's it, I'm in serious trouble. I'll drown him, I thought. It's too late to have second thoughts now, it's all or nothing. I ran into the kitchen and filled a plastic bucket with water and returned to the room and put it on the floor. I stood astride him, putting my hands under his armpits, and I lifted him up and draped him over the chair, resting his torso on the seat. I then lifted his head up and pulled the bucket underneath and lowered his head into it. Being unconscious, he didn't struggle at all, and after a minute, the stream of air bubbles stopped. He was dead and had ceased to participate in any existence of personality, end quote. I just want to tell him off at this point. Yeah. Oh, like all this writing, he tries to, he makes it. He romanticizes yeah. it. Yeah, I'm just like, you, mm-hmm. just, you just killed somebody, dude. On New Year's Day... Hung over Dennis Nielsen, pulled up the floorboards, and with some difficulty put Stephen Holmes, now in full rigor mortis, wrapped in a curtain between the joists. At one point, while working at his terrible task, he had to retrieve Dee Dee the cat from under the floor as she'd gone exploring. A week after the murder, wondering how decomposition was progressing, Dennis pulled up the floorboards again to view Stephen's nude body. According to Russ Coffey, Nielsen thought about buying an electric knife and cutting up Stephen's corpse, but thought better of it. Dennis replaced the floorboards and left Stephen there, and for the next seven months, that's where he laid. It was on August 11, 1979, that Dennis Nielsen decided to get rid of Stephen's body once and for all. He burned it in a massive bonfire in the back garden. If the neighbors noticed anything at all, no one said a word. Whether Stephen Holmes was homosexual, again, is unknown. His friends and family had no idea were that the case. Some surmised that Holmes likely was drunk and fell asleep somewhere in the flat, and it was at that time that Dennis assaulted him. Perhaps Stephen had awakened and threatened to tell on Dennis, at which point Dennis dispatched him. We'll never know for sure. I haven't gone too forward on all of this. Yeah. But I bet, you know, I bet there's a lot of people that were saying that their kids, they didn't know. Yeah. Um, and because of the time mm-hmm. and, and the society, right? Yeah. Uh, that there was this added uh, weird shame. Right. Right. So I'm not surprised if, if all the families of his victims said they didn't know. I right. wouldn't be surprised. And it doesn't mean all of them were. Right. But I'm like, wow, really? Like 15? And nobody knew that any of them were gay. It kind of goes, to, to me, it sort of tips the hat to my point of how society treated gays back then. It would take 23 years before Stephen Dean Holmes was finally identified as Nielsen's first murder victim. Dennis was so deep in his fantasy about keeping the youngster with him, even if Stephen had told him his name, it wasn't really that important. Dennis had just wanted a body to keep him company over the new year. From Russ Coffey's Dennis Nielsen Conversation with Britain's Most Evil Serial Killer, quote, The boy's mother, Kathleen, a waitress, reported her son missing soon after his disappearance and continued to campaign to find him until her death in 2002. With a few good photographs of Stephen, she failed to make headway. Holmes' remaining relatives have found it too painful to talk about his death. Can you imagine the pain of the mother? Mm. He is 14 years old. And not knowing where he is all these years. 14 years old, he was a good-looking kid. You know, he, he probably actually had a would have had lots of opportunities for a, mm-hmm. a really interesting life and just gone, you know? And maybe it's, maybe it's a good thing she didn't learn of his fate before she passed away to have to deal with the burden of knowing that your child had been murdered. Yeah. I, I, I guess the not knowing is tough too, because then you're thinking, was it murder? It, did he not love me? Yeah. Did he just it, run away? Yeah. I've seen a lot of, a lot of parents saying, you know, as horrible as it was, at least I finally knew. And, yeah. The, the majority of times it seems it feels like at least I knew is kind of a greater like relief because a lot of them assume as well, right? So, mm-hmm. Yeah. 
On October 11, 1979, three months to the day after Dennis burned Stephen Holmes, he met a student from Hong Kong named Andrew Andy Ho outside an arcade at the Regent Place Hotel near Leicester Square. They went for a few drinks at St. Martin's Lane's Salisbury Pub. As was Nielsen's M.O., he invited Ho back to 95 Melrose for dinner and more drinks. Nielsen claimed that the conversation had turned to bondage play and that Andrew had demanded money from him for that. Dennis had tied Andrew's legs together and then straddled the young man in an attempt to throttle him into unconsciousness so he would be able to have his way with him. Ho proved to be more feisty than Dennis could handle. Andrew broke free, bashing Dennis on the side of the head with a nearby candlestick. Andrew Ho grabbed his clothing and fled to a nearby police station where he told cops about his scary encounter with Dennis Nielsen. Dennis Nielsen claimed that he was devastated that the young man had escaped and for years later said that he was embarrassed at the mention of Andrew Ho's name. In his memoir, Dennis wrote, Make no mistake, I wanted to possess him as I had done with that Irish boy ten months earlier. End quote. Police interviewed Dennis about the interaction and Dennis told them that it was simply rough sex play gone wrong, nothing to be worried about. And out of embarrassment, Andrew Ho had refused to sign out a formal complaint against Nielsen, so the matter was left at that. On December 3rd, 1979, Dennis Nielsen first met Kenneth Ockenden Jr., a Canadian student, and the reason this series of episodes are not away games. 23-year-old Kenneth Ockenden was in town on a solo trip, a big deal for the young man. He was there touring London and visiting relatives and old friends in the UK, a trip that he dreamt of and saved his money for. He was born in the UK in 1956. Kenneth's parents, Ken Sr. and Audrey, had emigrated to Canada from Croydon, a suburb of southern London, when Ken was only 14. Ken Sr. worked in Canada, near Toronto, as a janitor. Kenneth was staying at the cheap and cheerful Central Hotel at 1618 Argyle Street in London. It was a place to lay his head for seven pounds a night. He was more interested in seeing the sights and snapping photos with his ever-present camera than partying. Kenneth had been in the country since September. Argyle Street? That'd be more cheap than cheerful. So King's Cross, that's in King's Cross? Yeah. Back then was a rough neighborhood. They've, yep. they've given a, a, an, up, a, an uplift, a facelift recently. Actually, the station's really beautiful. You should go. And you, but it was rough back then. Man. Well, I do plan on visiting some of these sites while I'm there. Yeah. Yeah, because the third episode will release on the week that I'm in London. From Russ Coffey's book, quote, Ockenden's trip started with a visit to the Lake District with an old friend. He had plenty of money and made regular phone calls home. When he got down to London, he methodically ticked off the relatives on his list. He was also in almost constant contact with his mother's brother, Gordon Gillies. End quote. Kenneth was an outgoing young man. He drank and smoked in moderation and listened to music, growing his hair a bit long. The 3rd of December was one of his last days in the country, and he wanted to make the most of it. He still had plenty to see. Kenneth was soon to be headed back to Canada for Christmas with his folks. At 3 p.m. that day, Gordon Gillies got a phone call from Kenneth who told him that he'd be around the next couple of days to pick up some cash that Gillies was holding for him. Gillies, hearing voices and music in the background, asked Kenneth where he was. According to Russ Coffey's book, Kenneth told him that he was at the, quote, Princess Louise, an ornate Victorian pub that apparently had live jazz, end quote. That was the last time any of Kenneth's family heard from him. He'd last been seen by the family on the day before he disappeared. So that's interesting. So he's in Holborn. I know I know that pub. is mm-hmm. Actually, if you want to go anywhere, that's about a block from the British Museum. Okay. So he's in Holborn, which is sort of so Holborn, Covent Garden, Soho, that sort of all West End, that's all connected. So okay. he's, in, he's in this person's hunting ground, which is very scary. Yeah. Kenneth never showed up to retrieve his money. This was very out of character for the young man. After a few more days with no word from Kenneth Ockenden, his family decided to contact police. When the police talked to hotel staff, they told them that Kenneth had prepaid for another night at the hotel, but had not returned to pick up his things. At that point, police suspected foul play. In February, Ken Sr. and Audrey flew to London and began a campaign to find their son. 
They spoke with various news media outlets and Kenneth's disappearance was even featured on a television crime program. In March 1980, an article was printed in numerous papers around the country. It read, Mystery of the Missing Student. Police are looking for a missing Canadian student last seen in Greenford three months ago. Kenneth Ockenden, a 24-year-old engineering student from Toronto, last called on his cousin Ronald Ockenden of Farndale Crescent on December 2nd. He has not been heard from or seen since he left the house to go to an uncle's home in Carshelton, Surrey. The student's parents have recently arrived in the country to join the search. Ronald said, quote, He came to see me and left the house around 7 p.m. to go to his uncle's place in Surrey to collect some money. He planned to fly back to Canada the next day via New York, but since he left here he hasn't been seen and it's a real mystery. Police are anxious to trace anyone who might have seen or heard from him. He is described as 5 feet 5 inches tall, of slim build, with long, fair hair, right up Dennis Nilsson's street. I'm just thinking about this family. Mm -hmm. And whenever somebody goes, like, he was so far away from them. It's not like they can just, oh, let's walk through the field behind the house to try to find him. He's thousands of miles away, and they flew there. And whenever I see, like, people's children going missing in other countries when they're on holiday or something... It just imagine how out of control you'd feel. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if it happened in your own neighborhood, you would. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's just thousands of miles away. Where do you start? Like it's It's interesting that the newspaper didn't bring up the phone call to the uncle the next day. Mm. It, it's strange. I, I don't know why they held that back. Uh or maybe the news organizations weren't aware of maybe it at that point. Yeah, maybe yeah. they didn't know. But that there was not a lot of mention of Kenneth Ockenden at all in the newspapers, even though his parents had, had been on that TV crime show. But yeah. in uh, the local papers, there was not a lot of mention. Focusing on the local victims, eh? Yeah. yeah. Kenneth Ockenden's family put up posters all over the city, which they refreshed for the next couple of years. His case was investigated by British police for approximately three years, but no evidence was found to explain Ockenden's disappearance at the time. But one man remembered Kenneth well. Dennis Andrew Nielsen. Mm. Dennis Nielsen had met Kenneth Ockenden at a pub in the West End of London where Kenneth was eating lunch and having a quick drink before heading back out on his tour of the city. Dennis struck up a conversation with the good-looking, short, slender young man talking about his camera. Kenneth was just his type. By all accounts, Kenneth was heterosexual. However, that didn't make a difference to Dennis. Sexuality didn't sway Dennis either way. He had what he had in mind. It didn't matter because he didn't need a willing victim. They chatted about Kenneth's camera, his family, musical tastes, which Dennis was able to match, telling Ockenden about his own vast record collection that he had back at his flat, 95 Melrose Avenue. Dennis offered to show Kenneth some of the sights, and they left the pub together. After the pub, they spent the rest of the afternoon chatting as they walked around Trafalgar Square and the Parliament buildings. As Ockenden snapped photos of Big Ben, Dennis Nielsen sized him up. As it was getting dark, Dennis suggested perhaps Kenneth accompany him back to his flat so Kenneth could listen to some of Nielsen's music and have a few drinks while Dennis made them a meal. Kenneth agreed, and Nielsen led the way, and they grabbed a cab. At some point in their journey, Nielsen and Kenneth stopped into an off-sales liquor store where they bought beer and some hard stuff, rum and vodka, for their later drinks. Kenneth Ockenden settled in at Dennis Nielsen's home with his headphones on, listening to the Royal Philharmonic's Hooked on Classics, an album my parents had. I remember it well, although I'm not sure I'll ever be able to listen to it in the same way again after this episode. Dennis made them a quick feast of ham, eggs, and chips. As they ate, they chatted, with Kenneth seeming to be genuinely interested in Nielsen and his stories, which Dennis liked very much. As alcohol flowed and the night wore on, Dennis Nielsen's excitement increased. When Dennis had had enough alcohol on board, he made his move. Kenneth Ockenden was sitting on the floor listening to music. Dennis had been staring at him, fantasizing. Dennis walked up behind Kenneth and, using a ruse that he wanted to listen to music as well, grabbed a long headphone cable. Before Kenneth Ockenden knew what hit him, Dennis Nielsen had wrapped the cord around the young man's neck and began to strangle him. Bleep barked as they crashed about a bit, just like it happened with Stephen Holmes, but it was soon over and Kenneth Ockenton was dead. 
Dennis took the headphone cord from around Kenneth's neck and took a break, having a drink, a smoke, and relaxed for a while listening to some music before getting on with the real reason he'd lured Ken Ockenden back to his flat. Nielsen said after that, as was his ritual, he picked up the body of his victim and took it into the bathroom to clean up the mess made as Ken's body relaxed in the moment of death. The washing was an important part of the whole process to Nielsen. As he hoisted Ken's body over his shoulder, he later recalled being extremely sexually aroused in that moment, anticipating what came next. Nielsen stripped Kenneth, washed him, and then spent the night with Ockenden's body in his bed, talking to it and caressing it, as well as other things best left unsaid. According to Alan R. Warren, quote, The next morning, Nielsen took out his Polaroid camera and took several pictures of Ockenden in different poses, 15 in all. He lay with the corpse for several more hours while he watched television. Later that evening, Nielsen wrapped Ockenden's body in plastic garbage bags and placed him under the same floorboards that had also earlier hid the body of Stephen Holmes. He took the 15 photos in all to remember the young man and to use it as fantasy fodder later on. Not wanting Ken's things to be traced back to him, Dennis threw away the young man's belongings and tore up a large amount of cash and Canadian bills that had been in a money belt around Ockenden's waist. But Kenneth's body he kept. Over the next two weeks, four different times, Dennis would pry up the floorboards and retrieve Kenneth's body from its hiding spot. Nielsen would sit the body beside him in his easy chair as he drank, smoked, watched TV, and listened to music. Numerous writers, including Nielsen himself, have referred to the corpses of Kenneth Ockenden and Nielsen's later victims as merely props in his sick sexual fantasies. Nielsen made a cassette tape of music for the Job Center Company Christmas Party, and some of the music he used had been tunes that he and Ken Ockenden had listened to on the night of Ken's murder. Dennis claimed to be shocked when he heard the songs in this more festive context. From what I've read about him, it's more likely he took a certain amount of glee from seeing his colleagues dancing, drinking, and socializing to his murderous mixtape. Nielsen later recalled getting to know Kenneth more intimately than any of his other victims. He'd followed the search efforts for Kenneth on TV and in the papers. That said, Dennis didn't care that much. He misspelled Kenneth Ockenden's last name numerous times in his later memoir. In our next episode we'll learn of Nielsen's 13 remaining murder victims, close calls, and the aftermath of his crimes. I feel for this kid. Well, he's 24. I feel for this kid so much. Well, he was, yeah, he was 23 when he was murdered. 23. He's just out there having an adventure. And see, it. this is the thing. The more I read about Nielsen, the more I realized I could put myself in Ken Ockenden's place. At that age, at that exact age. You mean like being an adventure and, hey, let's go listen to some cool music. At know? that exact yeah. age, yeah. in that exact place, in yeah. that exact situation, yeah. being in the headspace that I was at the time, yeah. I was still drinking. Yeah. Heavily into drinking and I was insecure and... Uh, a little overly trusting of people I shouldn't have been. Yeah. And I am, was a smaller, slighter, fair-complexioned young man who would have been right up Dennis Nilsson's alley, mm -hmm. and I would have gone with him. I totally would have gone with him. I would have, oh, look, this older guy wants to chat. Oh, you I like the who sort of thing? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, how old was he at this time he was? Nilsson at that time was 33. Okay. So older, but not old yet. Yeah, right? no, yeah. I did hang out with people at bars who were older than God, me. So did I. Yeah, you know, and would go out different places with them. I didn't know these people from Adam. I did this all over the world, Mike. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would have totally gone back to yeah. Dennis Nielsen's place, had uh, ham and eggs and some chips, and loved every second of it, and then been strangled to death and yeah. stuffed under the floorboards. Yeah, I mean, that's not to say. People shouldn't go out and meet people and have a good time. Mm -hmm. um, you were lucky, and I think maybe I was as well. But I, you know, I met lots of people. Like literally, just go home to listen to music or meet their friends or yep. like just get invited. And I've had great times. Mm -hmm. But this guy was wrong place, wrong time, and got in this bastard's way. Uh, Crosshairs. I have had some wrong place, wrong time incidents. Yeah. Um, throughout my escapades yeah my younger days 
Yeah, I just relate to this so much. Yeah. I I wouldn't have known. I would not have had the slightest suspicion that this nice guy, oh yeah, there's this nice British guy who wants to feed me and give me more drinks. I'm all for more okay. drinks. So if when you're going to London, yeah, a couple of weeks, yeah, call me. Yeah. And tell me what address you've gone to. Yeah, right. I don't think <laughs> that's not something that I think you need to concern yourself with now because no. I'm I wouldn't be open to that now. No. But uh, yeah, I'm not going to, hey, that's a nice camera you have. Come on outside and show it to me. Clonk. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm not going to, you know. No, it's different times. Yeah. Anyway, that's it for Dark Routine episode 228, The Lonely Monster, Serial Killer Dennis Nielsen part two. It now, next week, I'm looking forward to that because we get to know a little more and it's oh, such a wacky, crazy dark story and it, it just it freaks me out that mm. we've done two episodes yeah and there's still 13 more victims yeah that's right it's time for voicemails you can leave us a message at one 327 5786 or one 877 darkptn We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. So we only have one voicemail this week, but that's okay. Someone called in. There was another one. But the person, I think, was, uh, how can I put this mildly, three sheets to the wind? <laughs> Perhaps a little <laughs> under the influence. And I don't know if they would... A, remember making the phone call. Or, or B, regret, like when you yeah, exactly. drunk text your ex. I have done stuff like that. I'm so glad that the internet didn't really exist at all <laughs> while <laughs> I was doing... so much trouble. Oh, my gosh. But anyway, uh, so here is our voicemail. And this one's a bit longer, so let's. I'm interested to see. Hey, Mike and Matthew. This is Kelly McDonald Mason, long-time Yumber Yarder and listener of the show. I wanted to share with you a story from my family tree. Uh, in 1932, in Shubenacadie, Nova Scotia, my great uncle Gerald decided to become a bank robber. His brother-in-law was the manager of the local bank and was fired due to financial irregularities and became an insurance salesman. So naturally, the best revenge was to rob the bank. And they needed a getaway car, so they asked a car thief named Edison to help them out. So the plan was Ray Fuse was going to enter the bank to sell insurance near closing time and stay until they locked the door. So when they went to let him out of the locked door, Gerald and Edison would rush in, tie everyone up, scoop up the cash, and leave and lock the door. Just a flawless plan, you know. And so Edison agreed to commit the crime, but he was on parole. So he decided it was in his best interest to tell the Halifax City Police who called the RCMP, and a sting operation was born. The police gave Edison a car and a gun, and he was supposed to act natural, and they'd stop them on the way to the robbery for carrying weapons in a stolen car. Edison would confess the plan, and the other two would be arrested on criminal intent. But there was one problem. As they were driving to the robbery, no one stopped them. Edison tried to avoid it, but no longer being able to, he uh, went on to the bank. And uh, the... RCMP were actually waiting in the back of the bank because in the time of Bonnie and Clyde and John Dillinger, they didn't want to prevent the crime. They wanted the publicity of stopping it. When Gerald and Edison rushed in, the police opened fire. Gerald, my uncle, great uncle, was killed immediately. Edison was shot in the shoulder and went back, fell back outside. A policeman actually followed him intending to kill him, but a doctor saw the event and stopped him, and Edison was put on a train to the hospital. The doctor was told Uncle Gerald fried first, but he told the police that was impossible, as the exit holes on a post were on the wrong side. Despite this, the news reports contained the police version of events. Edison recovered, told his version of events, and he wasn't charged. Ray Fuse went to jail for criminal intent, and all five of the policemen involved were demoted and or transferred. Ironically, following in the footsteps of Ray Fuse, the bank manager staff members who were victims of the robbery were later fired for financial irregularities. I've been doing some genealogical research and I stumbled across Uncle Gerald's uh, death certificate. And first they have him as unidentified bank robber, but that's crossed out and then his name is put in. And the cause of death says, shock from gunshot wounds inflicted 
by police justifiable homicide. Hope you liked it. Go take a shit in your hat. Thanks. Bye. Okay, now that's awesome. That's a great story. And thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much, Kelly. And everybody got like a little bonus mini episode right there. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. If you can tell us a story in three minutes or less co- coherently like Kelly it has did. has to be three minutes or less. Tell it. You can tell it and we will play it on the show. Because that's great. That's exactly the kind of voicemail that sometimes I hope for. <laughs> wow, that was really interesting. And Shubanakity interestingly, featured uh, in my friend Malcolm's life. He's from Shubenacadie. You know Malcolm. Yeah. Is he from Shub- He's from Shuby. Yep. That's where he's from. Yeah, because I saw him post recently that he's been here for 30 years or something. And I was like, I wonder where he's from. He's from Shubenacadie, Nova okay. Scotia. And uh, it also, Shubenacadie also featured in the 22 murders that happened in Nova Scotia during uh, the murder spree by that killer. Mm-hmm. In 2020. So right. interesting. Very, very interesting. Shubish, that uh, Shubenacadie. Shubenacadie. For, for such a small place, they have Shubenacadie Sam, who is the uh, groundhog at the zoo, who gives the, he's like Wyrton Willie. Okay. He's Nova Scotia's Wyrton Willie, essentially. So he tells us whether or not we're going to have winter. And then you have the the farm, the uh, wildlife preserve there. And that's pretty much it. Uh, and Malcolm's house and a pizzeria. <laughs> that's all that does it. I know people from Shubenacadie don't, don't come yelling at me. I know what Shubenacadie is like. Shuben- I like to say it. Shubenacadie. Shubenacadie. I love to listen to people who have never heard it said, mm. try to pronounce it. It's <laughs> like uh, people who are not from Nova Scotia trying to pronounce Muscadab at Tatamagush and Shubenacadie. <laughs> <laughs> say that 10 times fast. <laughs> exactly. Antigonish. And <laughs> Antigonish. Yeah, exactly. People are funny. So thank you very much. That is was a fantastic voicemail. Much appreciated. See you in the Ember Yard, Kelly. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 877 We'd love to hear from you even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. All right, it is time for our Patreon shout-outs. And uh, we have uh, one here that it looks like it is from a person named Carmen Weld. And Carmen is from West Kelowna, British Columbia. Kelowna. I like Kelowna. She's from West Kelowna. West Kelowna. That's the fancier part of Kelowna, if I remember correctly. Is it? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, I think these people that moved there and they pointed out always that it was West Kelowna. Well, Alan Warren, who we've mentioned multiple times in this show, is from Lake Country. Okay. Yeah, so Lake Country. It's beautiful. His place is beautiful. You could see the fires across the lake from his place mm. last year when there was the big forest fires. But Wow. So what does Carmen do there in West Kelowna? British Columbia, Matthew. Well, since uh, Calgary Stampede is on uh, last weekend, Mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, which is very far away, but they have their own little stampede. Yeah. And she is a Ogopogo rodeo rider. So she rides Ogopogo? Yeah. They scare Ogopogo. She jumps onto his back and sees how long he can be or she can be ridden for. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, that would be a fun job. That'd be a great job. But hey, I mean, how often does that take, or I guess the prize money is such that you only need to do it once you or twice a year. You only need to do it once. Yeah, there you go. You know, my, my aunt and my brother and I used to do that at the farm. My, <laughs> my grandfather had a few hundred pigs and my aunt would get used them. to ride the pigs she'd get them like running all past the fence and my brother and i'd stand on that we were really little and then we'd jump and try to land on one's back and hold the ears and see how long we could ride it for <laughs> those poor pigs they were big and we were small it was more like the, the, those poor kids in the end <laughs> they could have destroyed you yeah eat you like the pigs in uh what is it uh oh my gosh that happens yeah don't get me started Um, So next up, we have uh, a patron who I'm not sure where Lady Mac is from. So very mysterious name, Lady Mac. Lady Mac Mm -hmm. is a very mysterious 
very mysterious. It sounds movie. like a medium or something. I'm Lady Mac, I and bet, I bet Lady she Mac does seances. Is, I bet you it, it, she is a medium. Oh, she is a medium. Oh, I was right. So yeah. hey, you know what? I'm a little psychic too because I guess. <laughs> and where is Lady Mac from? Where is she from? Yeah, she's from Turkey Scratch, Arkansas. What turkey scratch are? Uh, where are you from? Well, I'm from I'm turkey from, scratch. Yeah, that's really close to bunny rub. <laughs> bunny rub. Bunny rub, <laughs> and it's 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 but it's it's a little west of of rooster run. <laughs> rooster run. Yeah. Too funny. I, I don't even know if that's an Arkansas accent, but probably not. When I was a little kid, uh, because I had trouble reading and understanding things, I used to pronounce it Arkansas. I thought it was Arkansas as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh well. I guess if you don't hear a name, like if you if you read it on a map, you have Kansas and then you have Arkansas. Right? Arkansas, yeah. yeah. Like, come on, like, it's not Arkansas. It's not. Let, let's campaign to make people Ch to change it. It's like, why don't you spell things phonetically? Come on, English. And you know there was already Kansas. Why, like, why did you try to copy them? But just and there's R. how many Kansas cities and how many Washingtons? Come on. Because they're like, we there's that Kansas, and maybe there are Kansas as well. And they decided, no, but this is Arkansas. This is our Kansas. Our Kansas and oh, became Arkansas. Hell. Uh, that's how it happened. There are two Kansas, and the, the, everyone said, but this is our Kansas, and then it became Arkansas. This is the truth. You heard it These here are first. Facts. These are facts. <laughs> These are facts. These are alternate facts. <laughs> no, they're the real facts. <laughs> Anyway, so thank you so much, Lady Mac. Thank and you, Lady Mac. If you could send me next week's lottery numbers, that would, that be, would be fantastic. fantastic. And we don't have any donut money donors this week, but that's okay. Um, if you want to send us donut money, you know how. I'll tell you in a minute. Thanks to all our patrons and donut money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash dark poutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And that's it for this episode of Dark Poutine, so don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple, folks. Bye, everybody. Bye. Love you much. Bye-bye. Bye. bye. bye.